It's day 352 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. Alrighty, today we are hitting up the most hotly debated and contentious scripture in modern day history. First Timothy chapter two, <laughs> but let's not get so caught up in chapter two that we miss everything else around it and ignore the fact that Paul is writing to his student Timothy, who is now the overseer of the church in Ephesus and giving him instructions on how the church should operate. But before we get into that, if you could please help us out, if you're returning to this Bible study and you love the word of God, could you please just hit that thumbs up button, that like button, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and also hit that notification bell. And that could be your little gift back to the channel and back to this ministry saying, you know what, we support you and we love what you're doing. We wanna partner with you in that. Also make sure that you are in our Facebook group. I did go live in there yesterday. I thought, oh, that sounds kind of fun. Maybe we'll start doing that, but only going to be in our Facebook group. So make sure that you are in there. And that is where you can get connected to our different connect groups that we have throughout the week. So make sure that you answer all the questions now before you try to get into the group, because we do protect it. There was a little bit of gatekeeping and it is for the protection of the group overall. So make sure you answer the questions so that our automatic admin assistant does not delete you by accident. We don't want that happening to anybody because that does happen sometimes and it's nobody's fault. And we hope you are as excited as we are about our Heart Dive 365 podcast. You can find out more information on that, how you can follow one of our podcasts, how you can give us a five-star review, even if you're not going to listen to the podcast on heartdive.org. We've got a link below in the description box, and that could be another way you could give us a little Christmas love is just to give us a good rating on that podcast so we start off on a good foundation and people will be excited about getting into God's word as well. And don't forget to download our Heart Dive 365 reading plan. You can find that also in the description box below on our website. And that requires you just to put in your email and just a heads up, those emails sometimes go to your spam or your junk folder. So make sure you check in there and confirm your subscription so that you can then get that email and download the reading plan. Any other questions you've got, either check out the description box or go over to our website, heartdive.org, and you can find most of the information that you will need right there. Otherwise, I'm ready to get into the word. It's a brand new day, and I am excited that God is here with us and that he is going to speak to our hearts. I know it, and I'm trusting that. So we thank you so much, Lord, for your presence first and foremost. Thank you so much, Father, for loving us, for being so good and so kind to us. And we never want to forget how good and merciful and just and righteous you are. In the midst of a difficult passage that we are about to study, oh God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will be our guide that you will speak to our hearts, that you will cover our hearts with grace, that you will protect us from any sort of deceit. And I just pray, Lord, that you will give us a strong conviction on your truth. That's all we want, Lord, is your truth and your truth alone. We never want to be led astray, and we really just want to know your heart, to see your heart, and to be able to live your heart out here on this earth. And so I pray that that will be the case today as we read through this, Lord. And even if we're left confused in the end, even if we're left not knowing and not having a conviction, that's okay, because we trust you that you will continue to work it out within each of us. So I just pray, Lord, that there will be no contention here today, no division, no dissension. I pray for unity today because we know that where unity dwells, Lord, you will command a blessing. And so I just pray that each and every one of us will continue to love each other in mercy and in truth. And as we come here today before you with humble hearts, I pray, Lord, that you will purify our hearts, oh God, that you will clear away any chaff, clear away anything that is keeping you from being able to penetrate deep into the deepest part of our innermost being, Lord. And so I just pray that we will come with clean hands and a pure heart as we just desire to worship you and to love you and to serve you with all humility and reverence. Help us also to forgive those who have hurt us, Lord. May we, especially in this season, dole out even more grace, more mercy, more kindness, more of your light to a dark and broken world. And as we focus on you, Jesus, as the world celebrates you, and maybe they don't even know it, I pray that you will indeed be glorified. 
So thank you for this time. Thank you for this group. Bless every person here, Lord. Let them know they are loved. Let them know they are forgiven. They are restored. They are renewed and that you are doing a new thing in 2024 as we finish out here in this year, Lord. Thank you for it. And we just give it all back to you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, you can see I got my nifty notes here. I just hope and pray that we can stay organized and do this well. All right, first Timothy. So the author is Paul, written now a couple years later between AD 64 and 66. This possibly was written during his unrecorded fourth missionary journey, but it's definitely after his imprisonment. The audience role, the recipient anyway, being Timothy, but this was intended to be read aloud in the church of Ephesus. So this is what is known as a pastoral epistle because this is that more instructional uh, writing to Timothy, who is the overseer of the church of Ephesus. And the theme of this letter is how to lead the church. It's that church instruction, how to have a good, flourishing, healthy church. And remember, Timothy is kind of young. Well, he's probably around 35 or 40 years old, but young for, I guess, more of an elder or pastor. Uh, he's very timid, much more so than Paul is. He's a student of Paul. And remember, he was half Greek, half Jew. His grandmother was Lois. And here in chapter one, we see him confronting the false teaching that is going on. So here we go. Verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God, our savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. So here he is flashing his ID to Timothy, my true child in the faith. So you can see that Paul mentored him. He had like a father son relationship with him. Very special relationship. Grace, mercy, Hmm, that's an additional word there. And peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he knew that Timothy was going to need a lot of mercy. God's loving kindness, as we all do. Lord, we need your grace, mercy, and peace as we read through this scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. So this is probably the Gnosticism that is floating around, which promotes speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. This stewardship is the orderly management where they were promoting clear and sound doctrine that was not going on. There was a lot of controversy in the church. And so he is saying, I urge you to stay there, Timothy, because Timothy is probably like, I want out of here. I don't want to have to deal with this. For some reason, he didn't want to stay. But Paul is saying, I need you to stay there. And I need you to hold it together because somehow there was a loss of truth. And this is a danger for any church is when you try to find something new in the scripture that's never been found before. That can be a very dangerous place to be because it can quickly lead you off the road of that sound doctrine. And with all of the accessibility today to every kind of teaching, YouTube, all kinds of books out there, all kinds of people publishing scholarly articles. We've got to be really careful and really discerning just because it's published does not make it truth. And so you just got to make sure that you are doing your own due diligence when somebody says, here, look at what this says, and make sure that that particular source is actually a scholarly material that has citing of historical footnotes that you can prove it because that is where we see a lot of the discrepancy today with all of these different beliefs that are going on in the church. And so if you are going to stray from the face value of the word, I just say, make sure that there is a good, solid, valid argument and that you aren't just taking the word of somebody who spoke it once and perhaps published it or even did a dissertation on it. I mean, it doesn't even matter if they've got the name doctor. A credential doesn't necessarily make someone a truth speaker, okay? So I just wanted to put that out there because this particular book here has deep sources of all kinds of beliefs in it, okay? So this is where you really got to pray for that discernment and do your own research is what I would say about this if you are going to stray from face value, okay? With that said, let's get back to Timothy and him not wanting to stay in Ephesus. Well, again, we don't know the answer. There are many reasons possible that he may have wanted to remain with Paul where he was 
comfortable. I mean, he may have felt unworthy of the call, inadequate at such a young age. He may have been intimidated or shy, maybe scared of the challenge, maybe even discouraged by the false teachings around him. So what about you? What is holding you back, if anything, from stepping into your ministerial calling? And some of you might say, I'm not called into the ministry. Well, actually, if you think about it, the word minister actually means servant. So really, we are all called, in a sense, into the ministry to somehow serve the kingdom of God. Could be right where you're at in your own workplace. But if you are not doing that, if you're not somehow serving the kingdom or serving the Lord in any way, what is holding you back from it? The aim of our charge or the goal of this is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And this should be everyone's goal, that we are indeed loving with a godly agape love, that we have a good conscience because we are acting in righteousness as best as we can. And we have that sincere heart and sincere faith with no insincere motives. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion or empty chatter. So there's speculation, there's gossip, there's criticism going on in the church, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So they are either boldly, falsely teaching, or perhaps they're not, but they don't have a good, mature depth of understanding quite yet. So that's where we're seeing the discrepancy here. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So how do we use it lawfully? It is to make us aware of our sin. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, and for those who strike their fathers and their mothers. So here we see a covering of the first four commandments, and these are all in relation to God, actually, who strike their fathers and mothers. This is going into the fifth through the ninth commandments, relation to people. For murderers, the sexual immoral, then who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted." And so he is not trying to instill any sort of legalism here. He is just saying, listen, this is our high standard of living right here. The commandments are still in place to show us where we might be missing the mark or going outside of the boundaries of which God created for us. And so I do want to bring us back a little bit and reel us in because we've been talking a lot about legalism and the fact that we are not saved by our works, but we are saved by grace. And so sometimes people can go a little too far with that saying, let's just live freely and we don't have to obey the commands. No, we still have to have a high standard. Having a high standard of living is not legalism, okay? Legalism is when you think that what you do makes you right before God, which we know that's not the case. Instead, we are only made right because of what Jesus did at the cross. That is the gift that was freely given to us by grace, and we cannot earn it. But that does not mean that we do not live our lives above reproach or to a high standard. We should be because that is then aiming for that holy life, that set apart life. Verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thank him too for that because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer. So meaning he spoke against God. I was a persecutor. He was persecuting all the new Christians an insolent opponent. So he was violent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. So this didn't make him any less sinful, but it definitely made him a little less guilty. It's kind of like comparing murder to involuntary manslaughter. Like he says, I was ignorant. I didn't realize that what I was doing was indeed wrong until Jesus got a hold of me. And that's the case for a lot of us, right? Like we didn't realize that we were so far off course until Jesus took hold of us and was like, get your life together. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So there was that abundant grace because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So that means he came to save, deliver, rescue all of humanity of whom I am the foremost, or he says, 
the chief sinner in some translation. So he's like, I'm the worst of them. And if he can save me, he can save anybody. But I received mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul knew God and he made sure to tell them, listen, this is who God is. He is the king of all of the ages, of all all time. He is immortal, meaning he is infinite. He's invisible. You can't see him, but you can definitely know him. And he's the one and only God. And we should therefore honor him, give him all the glory that is due. Now, this believe in him is written in the New Testament 185 times, meaning this is our sole condition for salvation is to believe that he came, he died, he rose again on the third day. So he is stating here that central part of the gospel here, that Jesus came into the world for sinners. So again, he never shied away from sharing the worst of himself because he knew that that was the most powerful thing to be able to declare God's true grace and his true mercy in his life. Because what good would it do if he just walked around acting like he lived this perfect little life, right? I mean, he saw so many conversions because of the redemption of Jesus and because of the fact that it was so evident. And to him, it was worth maybe the few people who would probably gossip about him or try to discredit him because of what he had done in his past, if that meant that God would get the glory in the process. And I'm at that point in my life too. I'm like, you know what? If what I have done, the mistakes that I have made will bring glory to the Father, then I will absolutely shout from the rooftops because of that grace that became so real to me that helped lead me to that true and final conversion in my life. I'll do it. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies. And remember, prophecy is intended to edify, encourage, give instruction and direction. Previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, so fight the good faith, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So these two, we don't know exactly what happened, but somehow they failed to fight the good fight. They perhaps rejected Christ and ended up shipwrecked, as he was speaking of. But Paul basically removed them from the church. And remember, removing people from the church was intended for restoration. It was not just to simply kick people out of the faith. It was in the hope that they would leave the church and say, I don't want to be out here in this crazy world. I want to go back to where it was safe, where I was in fellowship, where I was loved, where I was accepted. I mean, that is what the church should be. People should want to come back. And if they don't want to come back to the church, then we've got a problem. And so these two probably had a life of deliberate disobedience, refusal to repent. So this isn't somebody who just messed up once and stayed in the church. You know, they weren't like pushing it under the rug or anything. He's like, listen, these people are not heeding correction. And so we're going to have to just turn them over at this point. Chapter two. First of all, then I urge that supplications, meaning I'm asking for personal needs here, prayers, this is general words being spoken to God, intercessions, which is where we appeal with confidence and sometimes on behalf of other people, and thanksgiving, so our thanks to the Lord. So these, this is speaking about prayer in general. First of all, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. Now, remember that Nero was in position at this time because sometimes we can say, I ain't praying for that person because they're just wicked and cruel and they don't deserve prayer. But Nero did, probably didn't deserve prayer, yet Paul is urging them to pray for him anyway. Always pray for those in leadership, whether or not you think they deserve it. I mean, imagine if we did more praying in politics than we do fighting in politics. I think the world would be a very different place if that's what we were doing. But And that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. This is interesting here. Take note of this, that he is calling all people to lead a peaceful and quiet life. Godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So he wants all people 
He died for everyone. He wants them all to choose him, but sadly, not all will. And this knowledge of the truth is where we grow more in our knowledge after being saved. So he desires that for all, but it won't happen. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So there's God the Father, and Jesus is the one and only mediator where we have access to the Father through him. So our prayers should only be directed to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We only have access to God through Jesus. That's the only way. There's nobody else who can intercede on our behalf. So Mary can't do it. None of the saints can do it. It's only God, only Jesus. That's what this says here. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Now I deserve then that in every place the men should pray. Okay, is this saying that only men pray? Well, we know that Paul has already spoken about women prophesying and praying in church, and he was accepting of that. So this does not declare, and we cannot use this scripture to say, only men are allowed to pray, okay? He was just addressing the men who pray, right? I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands, so this would be clean hands, without anger or quarreling, anger being that slow boiling anger. So in other words, public worship should not be led by those who have impure motives, who have got dirty hands, meaning their hands are in all kinds of other stuff in the world. It needs to be holy hands. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is a proper for women who profess godliness with good works. I believe that Paul is addressing the fact that we need to be more concerned with our character than our good looks. And in other words, don't be a distraction because we got to remember the culture here, they are just coming freshly out of like prostitutional cults. And so dressing and appearance was what a lot of these women knew and were almost naive in the way that they would dress when they would go to church. And so he is saying, listen, I need you guys to be a little bit modest here, you know, cover up your lady parts so that you are not causing temptation to the men down across the room. And that should not make anybody's blood boil. You know, true godliness and beauty should be found in our character first, because you can have a real pretty person who has the best clothing, the best jewelry, the best hair, the best purses. And if she's got a ugly inside, I mean, how quickly that beauty fades, right? But on the other hand, you can have another lady who may not be by the world's standards the most beautiful, but man, when you meet that person and her spirit is just so kind and she is so loving and humble, how quickly she becomes so much more beautiful in your eyes. And this goes for men too. I'm just using the women as an example because that's who he was addressing here. And so that should be our main goal is that we are displaying honest and good and godly character before we're trying to just put on an outer appearance of beauty. And before we move on to verse 11, because here we're coming to the most hotly and often hatefully debated scripture, I want us to just put on a ton of grace right now because we are discussing the different viewpoints. I'm not going to do it in depth, but at least to be able to give those who may not even realize that there's a debate, depending on the church that you grew up in, and perhaps even be able to help those on the other side of a very strong stance understand where the other side is coming from before just putting up a wall. So if you do have a very strong stance in your belief, I just ask that you not keep your heart closed, but also don't keep it open to deception. That's not what I'm wanting to happen here. But cover it by grace and cover it by spiritual maturity because the contention really lies in whether you take scripture at face value and you just lay your stakes in the ground or you're reading contextually and culturally and you see this as just a localized scripture. Now, there's a lot of different avenues that veer off from that, but that's the main two things. So we are going to zoom out a little bit and get a bird's eye view of where these two different viewpoints come from. So verse 11, 
Let a woman learn. I'm just going to stop here in the middle of this sentence because this is a command. Paul is saying that women are to be learners of the word. They are to be allowed to be able to learn the word and to be educated, whereas they weren't before. So let a woman learn, okay? We can, in our brains, put a little comma here, quietly with all submissiveness. And this does not mean that she can never speak. And it does not mean that she is never allowed to take part in anything. What this means is she is to do so respectfully, with a good attitude, not unruly. And this is true of all believers. Remember where I said, take note where it says everyone is to live quietly and respectfully? Well, here it is. He's just reiterating that point. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Now, you are either going to see this as two different points here, either where women cannot teach and women cannot exercise authority, that's face value, or you're going to see it as one where it says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, where that viewpoint is a woman can teach, but only under the authority of a man. Okay, that's another view. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Okay, so we're going to stop just on this sentence alone. Like I said, there is this patriarchal view where that viewpoint is women can have zero roles in teaching the word of God, which I will just say is straight up false because always look through the lens of the entire Bible. And when you look at the entire Bible, there are plenty of women who were teaching the word of God and were even encouraged in doing so. And so we cannot say that that is what this is saying here because it contradicts what the word of God says in other places. For example, there was Deborah who was in a place of authority, even over men. There was Mary Magdalene who had the most important role in the entire gospel given the word of God by Jesus himself after the resurrection and said, go tell my disciples. She was in a teaching role. She taught about the resurrection. There was Phoebe, who was a co-worker and a teacher in the church. There was Prisca or Priscilla, who taught Apollos with her husband. Junia was imprisoned with Paul for having done the work of the gospel. And none of these women were ever condemned in the Bible for having been teachers or co-workers or co-laborers of the gospel. So I will stand firm on saying that women can teach the word of God. And obviously, I mean, I'm here doing it, right? The second viewpoint, which I already mentioned, was that, okay, then women can teach, but she cannot teach in the general assembly and she cannot teach over men. That is the more widely accepted view of this at face value. That is what is known as the complementarian view, which is not based on this scripture alone, but basically saying that there is a God created order in the church and in the family where men and women are both equal, but man has a different role as the leader or the authority in church and in the home. And they do not believe that it extends out to any other place, like in the workplace or in government or anything like that. They just say, by the word of God, what it says is that man shall be the leadership, the authority, not better than, not more than in the eyes of God, but simply just that's their role and it complements the women's role. Women can exercise their gifts in other parts. They just cannot have that one authoritative role as like lead pastor. That's kind of the main idea. And now we get to the opposite side of the debate. And this, this is where you will see the fire and the hatred and the anger start to take place between those who believe that at face value, this was saying women cannot have that position over men. This side over here, which is that egalitarian side, will say, that's not what this is saying. This is based upon the cultural context of the fact that women in Ephesus, one, and there are several different arguments. One is that women were being unruly in the church because they had this newfound freedom. And so they were being a little disruptive because, you know, they're young in their faith and either they're trying to learn. So they're asking questions out of turn or they are also now suddenly hoisted into this place of position and honor and they are abusing that. Another viewpoint is that they were coming out of what is known as the cult of Artemis, which is seen as, as I have 
heard of it as a feminine cult that worshipped the deity Artemis. And what they believe is that because there was this female worship, there was almost like this hyper-feminist movement in Ephesus. And so because there was, there was, again, disruption in the church of these women who had this domineering type of authority over men. Uh, But where it gets a little bit muddy is whenever you go and do the research on Artemis, I was not able to find solid evidence outside of couple of modern books and articles that were written. Uh, I did not find the proper citations that factually and historically state that this cult created this hyper feminist movement and that there was actually these women who were domineering over men in Ephesus. So that's where I'm at. I'm kind of like, I don't know if that argument stands true, but that's what they're standing on. Okay. So I just, you can go do your own research on the cult of Artemis and whether or not this is why Paul is having to correct this in this particular church. So I hope you've got a decent idea of where the two sides are on the debate. There are, again, a lot of different avenues, but these are the main points and these are the main debates. So he continues, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority. Now, this word authority is the Greek word authentic, which this is the only time in scripture that this word actually appears. And it does mean authority. What is debated is the fact that this word authority is that more domineering, forceful authority where they're abusing that authority and that freedom. And that is why Paul is having to correct this here. She is not to have that domineering authority over a man. Now, the other side just simply says, no, this says women are not to teach or exercise authority over men, period. Okay, so that's the two sides. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, For the most part, nobody thinks that women are to remain quiet and never say a word because, again, the Bible says otherwise, so we're running with that. This is just to have that humble, respectful attitude, which all believers are called to have that. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Okay, so now we're basing this off of creation here. And Adam was not deceived because he sinned with his eyes wide open, right? But it says, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So Eve was actually deceived by the serpent and therefore she sinned. So we have to stop on this one. What are the two viewpoints here? Well, for those who believe that this is just face value, they will say because Adam was not deceived and Eve was, women are going to be deceived more easily. So therefore she is not able to teach or be in this type of role. Face value, okay? But the other side of the argument says, no, this is in relation to what is going on here. Adam was formed first, then Eve. So the men had the authority first and then the women. And because women are so young in the faith, they are being deceived by this false teaching. And therefore, Paul is trying to curb the false teaching by women in this church. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is probably the most difficult passage to be able to interpret right here on both sides. Both sides will say, This is a tough one to figure out what Paul was trying to say. And I honestly don't remember what the two different debated sides are, but I found that most people rested upon this speaking of women being elevated despite her sin and the role that she played in Christianity, the fact that it was the woman who bore Jesus. It was from the woman that the Messiah came. And so the complementarian side would say, see, women are important. We don't want to try to push you guys down. You guys do have a role to play here. Just can't be pastor. (laughs) But the other side will say, no, this is actually saying that because the woman brought forth the Messiah and because the Messiah is the one who turns everything upside down and his whole intention is to bring everything back to the way God intended it from the beginning, where God made both man and woman in his image to rule over Eden, inequality. That's what Paul's trying to do here. Now, you could sit here and debate this all day with people, and they will come at you with 80 million arguments as to why scripture supports their side of it. So I'm not going to try to convince you, but where I just landed here with some of the problems of the viewpoints, and these are just a couple of the main ones that I saw. The first problem that says 
This is simply Paul's opinion. This is not God's word, and it is not applicable to modern day culture. Why is this a problem? Well, because we've got to remember that Paul is an apostle. He is one that is sent forth by God, and he is led by the Holy Spirit with authority to speak God's word. And so when we take that into account, we cannot just simply dismiss these words that Paul spoke and say, it doesn't matter for us today. Now, how far we take it and apply it to our lives is a whole different story, but that's the problem that I saw with that argument because there are some people who will say that. Like, this is completely contextual and it does not apply to us today. That's what they'll say. The second one was that, Women should not have any teaching roles. Again, I've already explained here, there are many examples in the Bible of women teaching, prophesying, holding authoritative positions, praying, you know, co-laborers with Paul. He even encouraged it. And so that thinking would be in direct conflict with what the word of God has spoken. And then third, the idea that this is based on the cult of Artemis. I just think this is a little far-fetched and a little too off the beaten path. That's what we were speaking about earlier. And the fact that this very word here is sandwiched between Paul warning against this kind of going off, veering off, digging, digging, digging so hard to find this brand new idea of like, look, I got the missing piece. This is what we've been missing all of these hundreds of years. I get a little wary of that. And that's where I protect my own heart. I am open to be able to listen to it. I am mature enough to be able to read the material and to watch the videos with an idea and a hope that you can change my mind. I'm like, I want my mind to be changed about this, you know, and that's the kind of heart that we should have. I mean, especially if it's like, yes, this is God's heart from the beginning. So you're right. We should be able to get back to that but without dismissing his word, right? So I'm honestly somewhere in the middle of all of this and I'm still praying through it. So if you're gonna ask me my opinion, I don't have a strong opinion. I I do on certain parts of it, but we can't be selective with it, right? I mean, like if you're gonna have people saying from a patriarchal type of viewpoint that women absolutely cannot teach at all, then you also are gonna have to say that we all need to take off our earrings and we all need to cover our heads and we can't eat shellfish. You know you're going to have to not be selective in the way that you use this word and apply it. But then other people will say, well, you're being selective if you say that women can teach, you know? So it just becomes like this whole rabbit hole that is very hard to get out of. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to you doing your due diligence, you praying, you sitting with the Holy Spirit over it and having that firm conviction. And you will know that you have reached that maturity when it does not make your blood boil. (laughs) Because I can talk about this in a very healthy way at this point. There was one time when I couldn't. But because I know where I personally stand in the Lord and I have a pretty good conviction on it, um, I still have some questions. And I'll even say that my questions are even within my own church of like, is that what this word says? Like, why is that being done? But this is what the word of God is saying. So there's still that discrepancy, but I can still sit under that teaching because I respect them as my teachers because I see their heart for the gospel and for people. And to me, that's the main thing. Remember when Paul said that as long as the gospel is being preached, all of that other little stuff on the side there, I'm not going to worry about so much. And that's where I'm at. I mean, even with my commentaries, you know, There's some commentaries that just have a very firm stance in certain things, and I am able to continue to go into those commentaries with a mature heart and with a lot of grace and say, I'm going to take that as supportive of the word of God. That other part doesn't quite line up with the word in its entirety, so I'm going to sit on that one for a little bit, and that's the way we should be, you know? And I think that God does this because he wants us to question. He wants us to have that communion with him. He wants us to be able to have conversation and say, Lord, where are you at in all of this? Because if we just were all knowing, what would be the point? We'd have no need to go to him, right? So I hope this at least helped you to see where each side is coming from. I hope I didn't cause more confusion. And really, if someone's viewpoints cause confusion, 
to me, that's a little bit of a red flag. Um, God is not a God of confusion and really neither is his word. If you know him, if you know his heart, you should be able for the most part to be able to decipher sound doctrine from that which isn't. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a lot of, no, I'm not going to speak that. I am hopeful that I will not receive any hateful comments here because we're not hateful people. We are very loving people. But um, I do want you to know that I am not opening this up for a heated debate. You know, that's not what this space is for. This space is to inform of the word to discuss it. We can discuss it, but hold back a bit if you are raging in your text, okay? Because that is raging out of anger. And and if I start to see hatred coming through comments, you know, I, I will lovingly remove <laughs> because this is not the space for hatred, okay? So if you are going to state your place or state your comments, do so, but do so in love and grace. And I welcome conversation, but not dissension, okay? All right, we got through the hardest part. Let's go, let's move on. Chapter three. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, so if you desire to have that elder role of bishop, pastor, um, but I would say basically, if you desire to be in ministry at all, I would, I would look at these standards to be your standards of any type of ministry position. He desires a noble task. Of course it is. You know, you are an example of the church. And so you've got to be a noble person. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. So again, this means living a life that is mature and consistently living those Christian values and having Christian conduct. The husband of one wife. Now, this has even been debated. Some people say, uh... This means, and it looks like at face value, he is not to be promiscuous. He is to have one wife, isn't supposed to be marrying, divorcing, marrying, divorcing. That's what this, I believe, intends to say. But some people say, no, this is saying that he must be married. If he, can, if he is not married, he cannot be an elder. I don't think that that's what that's saying, but that's debatable. Sober-minded, so meaning you have clarity of mind. Uh, Self-controlled, meaning you are orderly, you're able to control your emotion, control, you know, you're not hasty in your decisions. You're respectable, hospitable. So you're opening your home and your life for other people, able to teach. Now, this is debatable whether or not this means that you have knowledge in the word and you have the gift of teaching, or if this means you are teachable. I think both of those actually should be in the list. Not a drunkard. So you're on out, not out at the club getting drunk, not violent, but gentle not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And in other words, you are financially responsible. He must manage his own household well. That makes sense. You know, if if our families are our first ministry, well, the validity of ministry will show itself in families. However, I know a lot of amazing, faithful families that have had children who have gone off the beaten path, you know, um, and just out of rebellion. And to me, that is not a telltale sign of an unfaithful family. So, you know, you you hear, if you grow up in the church, you hear the term PK, and it usually has kind of like a negative connotation. People say pastor's kids are the craziest kids. I'm not saying that. That is not my statement. But, you know, the term PK kind of had that... Mm, like if you say you're a pastor's kid, because people would see them as rebellious. That is not the case. I know actually most of my pastor kids' friends are incredible. I mean, they've become pastors themselves, you know? So that's not what it's speaking of. It's just in general, they should have a solid family. How will he care for God's church if he does not know how to manage his own household? He must not be a recent convert. So he must be established in the faith. You know, he must be having served for some time, showing his faithfulness, or he may become puffed up with conceit if he is hoisted into position too quickly and fall into con condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. So he must have a good reputation so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So in other words, he should not be a hypocrite where he's living his life outside in another way than he is on the inside of the church. In other words, don't give you know, the critics a reason to be able to find fault in your life. Deacons, likewise, so deacons were actually just the servants, must be dignified. So they must be respectful, 
not double-minded, so not deceitful, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain, and they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So they must hold on to proper doctrine with a sincere conviction and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves as blameless. That makes sense. You know, let give them some time to prove themselves. Their wives likewise. Now this word is the word gune, which is translated to woman. So some people say this is speaking of the wives of the deacons, but some say, no, this is speaking to women in general. Must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For And this goes to show that men should have a role in the upbringing of their children and the management of their households. It says it right here in scripture, just saying. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So in other words, your service will be respected and it will be rewarded. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So he is speaking of the universal church, so the church in general. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. So he is saying, this is the main story here. Stick to this. And this comes from an early hymn of the church. He was manifested in the flesh. So he came as a human. he This is the incarnation. Vindicated by the Spirit. So this is the Holy Spirit's work in both the ministry of Jesus and the resurrection. He was seen by angels. So angels witnessed his ministry and resurrection. Proclaimed among the nations. So he was preached to the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. So this is speaking of the response or the salvation to what took place and taken up in glory. So this is speaking of his ascension. So in the end, I think that we as Christians should all strive to live up to these standards and not just reserve them for those who are in the ministry. Like we're, you know, placing people high up there and being like, ah, that doesn't touch me. So I don't need to live my life that way. Because remember, we are all essentially servants or we're all ministers. And as Christians, that is what we are called to do as we model our lives after Christ. So heart check, are you living your life above reproach? Which area do you think that you can work on? Chapter four. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences, I can't say that word, consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So this is probably the Gnosticism because Gnosticism, remember, basically said that anything physical is bad and only spiritual is good. And therefore they were telling people, you cannot eat, you cannot gratify your flesh, you can't do anything that is going to satisfy your physical being. And so he is saying this is deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And there will be people who will fall away. Now, this is not speaking of losing your salvation, but actually leaving your salvation. There will be people who physically walk away from the church because they will be deceived by the false teaching. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So if you can honestly hold it up to the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for this. I'm about to eat it. So if you can say that with your Big Mac, so be it. You know, eat the Big Mac. Just thank you, Jesus, for it. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. That's a personal conviction, by the way. If you don't think you can thank God for it, then I would maybe not eat the Big Mac. But in other words, he's saying, stay focused on Jesus. Don't debate and be legalistic about what these people are trying to get you to, to, to do. You know, stay focused on the main point of Jesus. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. So he is saying, Timothy, study godliness, not mythology, you know, stick to the main road here. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, because remember, they are surrounded by mythology, you know, so he is saying, don't have any part of that. Rather, train yourself for godliness. 
For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So another thing that they're surrounded by is physique. You know, you hear that term, he's a Greek god, right? Like you see those statues of those men who's like, pa-pow, pa-pow, their abs are like an eight pack, right? And so it was a big deal to have good physique back then. And so he is like, don't get caught up in that stuff because that stuff is temporary. That's only going to help you on this earth. But godliness is going to not only help you on this earth, but also in the life to come and for eternity. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So this toiling and striving, he's speaking of the persecution that they are facing. Command and teach these things. So he said for them to be good, be godly. And now he's saying, I need you to grow. Let no one despise you for your youth. Now, interesting, youth in this time meant less than 40 years old, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So Paul says here, set the believers an example in your conversations, the way that you behave, the way that you show God's love and live by the power of the Holy Spirit, the way that you trust in God, and the way that you present both your body and your mind in purity. So heart check, Does your life set an example for believers in these areas? Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And so he is called to make sure he preaches the word. This is notice number one. And I just sat here and thought, man, how much of our churches are actually reading the word nowadays? I feel like a lot of church sermons are more self-help, you know? I mean, you'll have a few little scriptures sprinkled in and and that's fine in the sense that, you know, it it does bring in new believers, especially it doesn't push people away or bore them to death, right? I remember sitting in Bible teaching churches when I was younger and just, you know, just so, ugh, like I cannot handle this. Uh, it wasn't until I matured that I actually appreciate that now, but this should be a priority is the reading of the word. Exhortation is the encouragement to obey. So this is part of that preaching and then also teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So make sure you are diligent and not neglecting your gift. And this is for all believers. We have been talking about our spiritual gifts. Don't neglect it now that you know what it is. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. So how do you immerse yourself? Well, it is doing what we've been doing for 352 days now. We have found ourselves a quiet and distraction-free time and space to be able to get deep into the word of God so that then we can progress. And I just wanted to sit here and say, man, have we progressed this year? There are ways to look at whether or not you have had progression in your life. So let's take a look here. And I encourage you to sit down with this, maybe do some journaling, write these things down. What are three significant spiritual lessons that you have learned this year or that God has really just spoken to you. He has really been uh, repeating it over and over and over again. Three significant spiritual lessons. Uh, Do you have any relationships that have either started, have flourished, or have transformed since you started immersing yourself in the word? Do you have any special projects that were completed? Uh, Any causes that may have advanced that you started? Any areas of personal character that have matured in your life? And are you mobilizing and using your spiritual gifts? And I think it's really important for us to finish with this, you know, to take a look back on the year and say, man, I have grown. You know, there are some things in my life that I see that have changed. And it is because I've been in the word. It is because I'm changing from the inside out. So if you are willing to share, we'd love to hear from you. If you're able to answer any of these questions, if you could put those in the comments, I think that would be pretty awesome to see how people's lives had, have changed in a very specific way. Like we've seen comments throughout the year and that's wonderful. But I think if people start to see specific things, they'll say, oh yeah, you know what? That actually makes me think about this in my life and that person in my life. And so I think this will be very encouraging for others if you're willing to do that. 
verse 16, or is that 15? I can't see. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, this is not speaking of personal salvation, because we've all been personally saved, but this is more so the daily sanctification. However, it could mean salvation for others who do hear you giving part of your testimony and how God has really changed your life throughout the year. And now Paul gives instructions for the church in chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, so make sure you're respecting the older men, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, so treat the younger ones like they are your younger brother. Older women as mothers, so you should have respect and honor for the older ones. Be devoted to them. Younger women as sisters in all purity, so make sure you are honoring the purity of the young women. Verse three, honor widows who are truly widows. So the church was actually charged with taking care of true widows. So these would be widows who had no family, uh, widows who were left with nothing. The church was the ones, one who was supposed to be taking care of them. And honoring them would mean not only showing them respect, but also supporting them financially and making sure they are meeting all of their physical needs as well. So they were kind of like their social security. That's what the church was for true widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So in other words, if you have a parent who has passed away, it is your responsibility to take care of the other parent. She who is a true widow or truly a widow, meaning a godly widow, the one who deserves to be cared for by the church, if she is left alone, uh, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day, but she who is self-indulgent is dead. So this would be an ungodly widow. And this means that she is separated from the fellowship, even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That is some pretty heavy speech right there. Like if you don't take care of your family, you're worse off than an unbeliever. And it's because if you can't even care for your own family, how are you going to be entrusted to care for other people? So that is why he is speaking that here. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. So this enrollment would be the list of the of the widows that the church is supposed to take care of. And they only wanted those who were less than 60. Why? Having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows. Here's the why, sorry. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to m marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from those house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. So in other words, families have the responsibility to take care of one another. Don't expect the church to do it. It's kind of like putting your kids in school and expecting the teacher to take care of your kid. You know, it's like, no, you have that first responsibility ability to take care of your child and to teach your child at home. And then the teachers just supplement that. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So those who have done the ministry, especially those who preach and teach and have done it well and honorably, this double honor means financial support. You should be supporting the ministry and the church financially. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. So these accusations must not just be accusations. It must be factual. That's why you have the two to three witnesses. And 
if you find that it is true, it should be rebuked in public so that the rest of the people say, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to make sure I don't do that. <laughs> you know, make sure they live their lives cleanly so that they are not rebuked publicly. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in in the sins of others, keep yourself pure. So this laying on of the hands is that commissioning. It's when the elders would lay hands on uh, typically the men and commission them into the work of the church. And so it's saying, don't do it hastily, you know, and even uh, meaning don't restore a person from their sin too quickly. Because if you just throw them back into ministry, they are not going to have that proper time for healing. And so restoration does need to have some time attached to it to allow the person to be able to heal, to be able to repent, to be able to be restored. So there should be some biblical amount of time and also biblical evaluation before they get put back into the ministry. But the intention is that they do get restored to where they once were. And when he says, do not take part in the sins of others, that is both in setting a bad example for others to then go and sin, but it is also approving or ignoring other people's sin. That's two ways you can take part in the sin of others. And of course, keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Wait a minute. I thought he just told those who were in ministry not to drink. Well, this is speaking of medicinal wine and probably Timothy was abstaining from drinking wine because of the charge that was placed for those who were in ministry not to get drunk. And so he may have been abstaining, but he was suffering physically because remember he was sick. And so Paul is saying, listen, I need you not to worry so much about what people are thinking. I need you to take your medicine, like drink the wine, just don't get drunk. The sins of some people are conspicuous, giving before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So some people might be able to hide their sin for some time, but it will come to the surface. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. In other words, also the good things in your life that are hidden will come to the surface and you will be rewarded for them. So hold tight to that if you feel like what you were doing, your good works and you know all of the good things that you've spoken or all of the, the things that you've even thought in your mind that have been good and glorifying to Christ, those things will be rewarded. They will be seen one day. And he finishes off here in chapter six. Let all who are under a yoke of bond servants regard their own master as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have been have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So while Paul is specifically addressing slavery here, that's not culturally applicable to us today, right? So we've got to find how it is. And we've spoken on this before, but this can be applied in the sense of employees and employers. So as employees, we also should be respectful to those who are over us in leadership, and we should have good work ethic so that it will testify to our faith. I mean, we really should be the best workers as Christians. And the same thing for employers, you know, and the way that they treat their employees with fairness and with respect. And notice how it makes a very specific mention of not taking advantage if your workers or your bosses are Christian. In fact, it should motivate you to actually be better at your job. And your work ethic should remain solid when you are working around Christians. So heart check, does your work ethic testify to Christ in you? So he continues here, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit. So false teaching comes from pride and understands nothing. So this does not agree can be denial of what is spoken. It can be ignoring what is spoken. It can be twisting what is spoken. And it can be trying to just explain away what is spoken, which we were kind of just talking about, right, a little while ago. So you got to let that one fall on your heart, however it may be. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, 
evil suspicions and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So this is referring to those false teachers who really were more interested in theory and debating than actually preaching the word of God and preaching the gospel. And the thing is, is that you don't have to be an active opponent of the word to be an enemy of God's word. You know, you can actually be preaching the word of God, but still be the enemy of the word in the way that you're preaching it and in the motives that are behind it. So he is like, be careful of that. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So we got to make sure we don't switch this around because some people have taken this verse and said, you will have great gain if you have godliness with contentment, meaning God's going to give you all the riches and all of the blessings if you're content with him. So give me all your money. <laughs> you know, that's not what it's saying. No, he's quite the opposite. No, it is saying that it is the godliness with contentment that is the great gain that you receive because you will not have that itch for more. You know, you will just be at peace with where you're at in your life because you are rooted in the eternal. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And I would probably say that we can say that this is true for those who uh, getting rich is their main focus in life, because when you see that, you will find that there are more miserable rich people than there are actually happy rich people. Uh, but it does not mean that you cannot be happy if you are rich, you know, because there were plenty of people in the Bible too who were rich and still godly. I mean, hello, David, you know, Solomon, Abraham, they were rich. They were very rich, wealthy. And so it's not saying that being rich is a bad thing here, but it's just saying you you be content with what you do have. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Now notice that it says the love of money. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evils. What people get this wrong all the time, they will say, well, if money is the root of all evil, then why is the church asking for my money? Well, first of all, you got that wrong. It is the love of money. We're talking about materialism here. Money is not the issue. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. And if you do pursue these things, I mean, you're going to do pretty well. You know, if you are pursuing godliness and righteousness, first of all, then all of the other things will fall into place. Fight the good fight of faith. So we're still going to be fighting until the war is done, right? So fight the fight of faith. Don't fight your spouse or your next door neighbor. No, he's saying fight the fight of faith, which is the spiritual battle. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. So don't be prideful if you do become rich, because it is very easy to believe that you are somehow more than when you have more than not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So here he is basically saying riches are not a bad thing. Just make sure you use them properly. Like if you are blessed, be blessed so that you can be a blessing. And the greatest test of that will be in tithing. Because I know so many people who will say, I'll start tithing whenever I start making a little bit more money. But if you can't even tithe on the little amount that you have, you're probably not going to tithe on the big amount either. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So while you cannot 
keep the things or take them with you into eternity, you can send it ahead in your giving. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. So we have all been deposited the gospel. It's been entrusted to us. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called quote, knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. And this you is plural. So that's how we know that this was intended to be read to the church. And it was intended for the universal church overall. We survived. I hope you survived. And like I said the other day, if you have a spiritual maturity, you should be able to read this and still have joy at the end of these chapters. In fact, I have more joy than I did before I started reading. I ain't gonna lie, I had a little bit of anxiety coming into this and I was like, ooh, breathing. I'm like, Holy Spirit, please help me be able to do this and to do it well and to allow him to just speak through me. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we're gonna just come back to it, the fact that Paul is saying this is the way a church should look, it doesn't mean that the churches will look like, because we're all failures, right? We're all people who are trying to lead these churches. But these are the main things that we should be looking for in church or in ministry, okay? So this was according to verses 12 through 16. So verse 12, how does the church or the people who are in leadership exemplify the Christian life? It doesn't mean they're perfect, but... They are doing their very best to be able to walk the walk, to practice what they preach, and are consistently living in that. Uh, how they minister with God's word. So it's not just a bunch of fluff. You're actually using the word of God to be able to minister to people. How the various gifts are used. So if you're looking at the spiritual giftings in people, are those things being utilized? Is there spiritual progress? Do you see fruit coming forth from that tree? Do they practice honest self-evaluation? So are they prideful in saying, we don't need to change, we're good, we're doing everything right, or are they willing to hear correction and say, mm, let's take a look at that. You know, maybe we are a little bit weak in that area. Uh, do they have a genuine concern for salvation of others? This should be the biggest one right here. Like, is your church seeking to get people saved? And the way you're going to do that is by preaching the gospel. So is the gospel being preached? Is the focus on Jesus and your relationship with him? Oh, Lord, thank you for this word today. Thank you for Paul. Thank you, Lord, for all of the scholars and all of the theologians, all of the teachers out there who have dug deep into these passages and have done their best to be able to educate us in them. But Lord, we are still left here with a divide, with a line uh, that is in the sand, and it is a very, very dark line. <laughs> and it is one, Lord, that has kept the church divided for centuries. And so I just ask today, Holy Spirit, that you will bring peace to our heart about what it is that we have just read. I pray that there will be a firm conviction in our spirit about your truth. And I just pray, Lord, that it will all be seasoned with grace. And even if there are people who don't believe what we believe, Lord, I pray that we won't count them as enemies. We're still on the same team. We're still in the same boat. And we still need to row together. And so I pray we'll be able to do that, Lord. I thank you, God, that you have progressed us in our faith. You have progressed us in our life and we see the fruit of that, Lord. And so I just thank you for this year and for everything that you've done in it, the way that you have shown up, uh, even whenever we didn't show up, Lord, the way that you have been consistently there and you have continued to not only grow us, but you've grown this community. And so I just pray you will continue to do that, Lord, as we remain humble and open to what you are doing. And we just pray that we will heed the call to be able to partner with you in that and to be able to take part in it, Lord. Show each person what they can do to be a blessing, not necessarily to us, Lord, but to you. What can they do in their life to be able to bring you glory? And so we just thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. Thank you so much as we go into this Christmas season for what you have done. Just the fact that you were born, that you came, and that you just chose to offer yourself because you loved us that much. 
that you saw our hearts instead of seeing our failures. And so I just pray that we will always honor you and never lose sight of that. May you truly be seen as the reason for the season, Lord. And I just thank you for preparing our hearts in this season, knowing that we will continue to unlock more and more of your truth and your spirit. And I just pray that uh, you will show us the way, that you will illuminate our path, and that you will allow this word to be able to guide us every single day. So thank you. We love you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will continue to work on our hearts throughout this week, throughout this day, with whatever it is that you have laid on our hearts, the seed that you have planted. May it be a loud speaker that is in our ear and that is helping to direct our path. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. And I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.